the video today, we're going to kind of change our approach a little bit. Okay, up to this point, we've always done kind of analysis problems where I knew section dimensions, I knew the reinforcing, and we were looking to know, well, how much moment can all of that carry? Right? But in design, that's not generally how it works. Okay, a lot of times I know the loads, but I don't know how much reinforcing steel that I need. And so we need to come up with a strategy for how do we start to prepare to do the design. And then we'll also start looking at some of the, the ACI requirements for minimum steel areas and things like that. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to kind of kind of go back and, and look at our situation just a little bit more, okay? If we draw the strain diagram in general, remember that it looks something like this. It was a linear diagram. You know, again, we're looking at singly reinforced beams that we had some epsilon CU value. Typically, this guy is 0 0.003, and then we had some corresponding epsilon down in the steel. Now, I want to kind of be careful on this. I've kind of changed the nomenclature a little bit. I'll show you that in, in general, but let's just think about this picture just a little bit, okay? There are three possible situations that exist for this diagram, okay? The balance condition basically um, is the case where my epsilon s is equal to epsilon y, okay? Or the epsilon s as we have it drawn is equal to epsilon y, that we've yielded the steel exactly at the exact same instance that this guy went to 0 0.003. We have the under-reinforced section, which is the case where epsilon s is greater than epsilon y, okay? And this will lead us to um, what we call a tension controls scenario, okay? Uh, meaning that we're kind of, we're, we're well past yielding in the steel and it's, be, it's a, a reasonably ductile behavior that's happening, okay? But there's also the case where I could have epsilon s is less than epsilon y. Those are the three possible outcomes for any given strain diagram. Okay, this one is the over-reinforced condition and this almost always leads to a compression controls scenario or I'm gonna crush the concrete before I yield the steel. This is not ductile. Okay, so we wanna kinda, that guy is not ductile. So we wanna try to avoid this guy. And in fact, remember when we were looking at the reduction factors, those fee factors that we applied to our design moments, this guy got a pretty hefty penalty, right? If he was like 0.65 on this one, and then my under-reinforced section, depending on the magnitude, could be as high as 0 0.9 or somewhere in between, all right? So, so these are the three cases that exist. Now, like I say, it's a little bit unusual, and I know your textbook doesn't really talk about the balance condition a whole lot, but for years, ACI 318 used the balance condition as kind of a kind of a break-even point and what we can do is we can use this if I can find this situation because that one's pretty easy because I know all of the values right I can find my yield strain here and I can know that this is 0 0.003 I can define that line and know everything about it and find every strain in between okay so if I can find that then I can figure out well you know based on some other row value Am I less than that amount or am I greater than that amount? Okay, so that kind of leads us to you know, our balance condition. Okay, so the definition of this balance condition, as we talked about in an earlier video, is that concrete crushes and steel yield at the exact same instant. Okay, now, for a given cross-section and reinforcement pattern, that may not actually be possible. But for the exercise that we're doing, you know, for a given layout, what is the strain condition where that would occur? Okay, and so that's what we've said that we outlined up above. The epsilon CU is 0 0.003 and epsilon S is equal to epsilon Y. That's the definition of the balanced condition. All right, so what happens is, is I can kind of take these formulations and I can, you know, using some Whitney behavior, I can calculate row balanced as simply being 0 0.85 beta 1, that's that Whitney approximation, times F prime C over FY multiplied by the ratio of C to D. Okay, and that will get me this balanced row um, a reinforcement ratio for us there, okay? Now, if I kind of go one step a little bit further with the C's and the D's, I can actually plug in my strain values, which this equation is a little is kind of useful when I don't have 60 KSI steel, okay? I can just plug in my epsilon Y here, and there's this fractional value that will show up because, you know, 0 0.003 plus 0 0.003 plus 0 0.002, that's a three-fifths fraction, okay? And so it's a very, very simple formula to be able to calculate this row balance, and we'll take advantage of that as we start to start to kind of look for for this. So that's the, the balance condition for finding rho for the amount of steel that you would put in for a balance condition. All right, so now let's go to the next one. Okay, we're gonna start off with 
under reinforced beams. Okay, now while the word under reinforced makes it sound like it's dangerous, this is actually a good thing because this guy will ensure ductile failure. Okay, meaning that the steel will yield and the steel will not just suddenly, you know, depending on the on the strength, will not just suddenly just break or have a brittle failure. It will have some some form of ductility associated with it. It'll give some warning before it actually comes crashing down. Okay, this is usually the desired situation as opposed to the over reinforced where I crush the concrete and without warning it's game over. Okay, so that's what we want to kind of be, be mindful of. So all we're going to do is we're going to play the exact same approach that I have a beam that's B and D and then we're going to assume then that for, for under reinforced beams that the, the strain in the concrete is somewhere less than that 0 .003 value, that we're not crushing it yet, okay, but that the strain in the steel, now again, one thing I needed to point out, that I meant to, I mentioned it, okay, if I go back to the last page, notice before we always said epsilon s was at the centroid of the pattern, now we're going to say for the p purposes of this discussion, it's located at the outermost um, location of steel closest to the tension face okay if you recall this is what ACI calls the epsilon t value used it to find the reduction factors in that table from last time okay all right but for us we're going to go all the way down and we're going to look at this epsilon s being equal to epsilon i okay for under reinforced beams okay what we do is we choose our reinforcement ratio which that's just as over b times d such that rho is less than that rho balance limit all right, so by calculating row balance, I can very quickly set a row that will guarantee me an under-reinforced situation, okay? And this will help us to ensure that we have a tensile or ductile failure. Now, again, this is kind of a design rule of thumb, and in fact, this was a, an approach back in the old ACI provisions from, you know, 1990s and before, where they actually had you calculate row balance for your section, and then they limited row to half of that. All right, so if, I, if this is the case where I yield and fail concrete at the same time, if I go to half of that amount of steel, then my strain will go up and I'm much more ductile. This will get me the case. This is still a very good rule of thumb even today because in a design problem, if I choose this guy, almost always this will lead me to being able to assume that phi is equal to 0 0.9 right off the bat. Okay. Now, again, there are cases where I don't want to do that, but for just kind of a general, let's get, you know, get, get a feel for how much steel we need, is my section the right size, those kind of things. It becomes a very, very powerful technique. And again, this is a rule of thumb. You won't find this in your textbook. You don't find it in ACI anymore, or at least not that I've been able to relocate. Okay. And so, but it is a kind of a valid approach. All right. Now, kind of what the, the, the premise that we're getting at here is that we want to have a tensile or ductile failure in all cases. So if rho is about the same as rho b, but maybe a bit smaller, okay, what can happen is the compression failure may still occur, okay, and this can happen because my material properties are never exact, right? We called f prime c 4000. What if it was 5? What if it was 3? You know, what if my steel stresses or my ultimate steel um, or my ultimate concrete strain was not 0 .003 or some other number. There's some error that falls into these material calculations that we had. Okay, we also get some additional capacity due to strain hardening of the steel. Remember, what we've done in our steel diagram is, you know, the, the basic stress strain curve for steel looks something like that, but what we've done is if that's Fy and this was epsilon y, we've approximated this as that picture and we've completely disregarded the strain hardening region. Okay, in reality it's there and that can change things as well. So we could actually get some extra strength out of our steel and that would cause concrete to crush first. So we want to be kind of careful. Okay, and then the, the other one that's pretty big is that actual steel area provided is always higher than required because of our standard bar sizings, right? You know, say that you needed an AS that was, you know, 2.9 inches squared exactly. Well, if I do that, there is no combination of bars that will get me to that easily. So a lot of times I'll just choose to use three number nines, okay, which is 3.0 inches squared. And so what you've done is you've added 0.1 more steel than what was actually needed. And if I add more steel, that reduces the strain, okay, which then also drives up the row value. And so this guy can kind of get us in trouble. So we want to give ourselves a little bit of room to work with so that I don't accidentally get pushed over into an over-reinforced case by assuming rho equal to rho b, okay, which is why the rule of thumb of this guy being half of rho b is, it, 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 it's so good. It, 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 it works out so well for us when we start to do that, okay. That will get us high strains in the steel, okay. All right, now what we can do is we can go in and we can start to look at calculating the maximum reinforcement ratio for tensile failure 
with an epsilon t greater than 0.005. Okay, and again, some sources call it epsilon t, other sources call it epsilon s. That's all we're saying is that guy is epsilon s. And again, that's that strain at the outer location. Okay, so what we do is, you know, and the way the textbook presents this to you is, is that for beams, we're going to calculate a row that corresponds to a strain of 0 0.005. This is the one that gets me 0.9 on phi. Okay, and when I do that, this equation for rho becomes 0 0.85 beta 1 times f prime c over fy, and then we're going to take that and we're going to divide that by this ratio of epsilon u, which is my concrete strain, over epsilon u plus 0 0.005. Okay, this equation will get me phi of 0.9 every single time. Okay, and then for under-reinforced sections, the design moment then becomes this equation, right? You recognize this piece. That was exactly what we derived from Whitney the last time. And all I'm doing now is adding phi to be able to get to my design moment on this case. Okay, all right, and so what LRFD requires, and so the approach that you use to kind of to, to solve one of these problems, you know, when you're given you know, a little bit of structural analysis and you have to find it, you know, how big a beam or what's the reinforcing, the entire design procedure can be broken down into a series of a couple of simple steps. All right. Remember that our LRFD methodology, which is what we're kind of doing on our ultimate strength here, is that we want the phi mn, this is the capacity, okay, being greater than applied loads, factored applied, uh, you know, our loads with the 1.2 dead or the 1.6 live or whatever that case may be. That that's our criteria, that we got to be able to carry more load than what we're actually putting on it once it's factored. So all you're going to do is you're going to compute the factored load and the moment, mu, on this. Okay, we're going to guess phi of 0 0.9, okay? And when I make this guess, what we've done is we've assumed epsilon t is greater than 0 0.005, okay? And by doing that, so again, this is the first assumption that we're going to have to verify in any problem, because if I don't have this, then I don't have that. Everything else we do after it is wrong, okay? The third step then is we're going to compute that row value at that strain of 0 0.005 for the section. All right, and then when I do that, then I can compute the, basically I can walk this thing backwards at that point and solve for AS required, okay, by simply saying, well, we know that the row for 0 0.005 strain times BD will be that AS amount, okay, and so, so that's the one way that I can get to the area of steel that I need. Now, again, you need to verify then once you've chosen your bars, because again, this is that, you know, we had 2.9, but we used 3.0, you know, on there that we just talked about, that scenario, that we want to make sure that this guy is still okay. Okay, and at the same time, once I add that extra little bit of steel, that epsilon t is still greater than 0 0.005. Okay, if it's true, then the design is complete. If false, now we got to figure out, well, what the heck do we need to do? Okay, and so there's a couple of options for you, okay? The first one is, is that, and probably the easiest, is that I increase b or d in step four, okay? Typically, we like to increase D because in doing so, I also change the moment of inertia of the beam, which helps us in deflections, okay? But this becomes the simplest ch uh, the change in this because as I pull that, you know, if we go back and look at our, our strain diagram, okay, for, for a given scenario, if this is my strain of 0 0.003, if all of a sudden I increase D and I was getting 0 0.005 here, then as this thing comes down, I get even higher strains down there. Okay, so if this guy isn't over that 0 0.005 limit, the one that's down here by increasing D more than likely is, okay, which then gets me back to my fee of 0.9 as a desired limit, okay? All right, so, so that's one option. The other option then is I can start monkeying around with the area of steel, okay, is that I can increase the area of steel but run the risk of, in the process, decreasing fee as a result based on that ET value, okay? Now, this scenario tends to work okay if my design moment capacity is just is about the same as the MU, but not quite. Okay, if I just need a little bit of extra to get me over, over MU. You no, know, um, if you have a much larger dif difference, this is not the way that you wanna go, okay? It'll be kind of, you'll be giving back so much you know, material in terms of extra steel that you have to put in just to compensate for this, this penalty, because again, this guy, if you're sitting at a fee of 0 0.89 and you change the area, all of a sudden I can drop this guy as low as 0.65, okay? And so you're giving up nearly 25% or, yeah, 25% almost the extra capacity just because you were getting a little sloppy with the AS. So generally, I try not to monkey with the area. I try to monkey with the depth if I can. But sometimes you don't have that option, you know. Maybe you have some architectural considerations or, 
or something that's preventing you from going to a larger depth or a larger width or some such. Okay, so you know we want to want to kind of be careful. But those are basically your two major options. I could also play around with you know some of the other terms. I could change Fy, which again 60 ksi is probably the most common. Or I could change the concrete strength. Maybe that's an option. You know, but again, it's a kind of you know the biggest bang for the buck comes out of these two guys. So to say. All right. So those are some of your options that happens. Okay. Now, okay, we do have one potential problem that we haven't talked about yet. Okay, and that's what we got to kind of take a look at. And this is where some of the ACI requirements start to to kind of come in. Okay. If you remember, okay, if the cracking moment is greater than the flexural strength. Okay. So remember back to our NV curve on this. We had a curve that looked something like it was linear for a little while, then it cracked. And then it went up to yield, and then it did that number, right? So this was MCR. Okay, this was our yielding in the steel, our first yield. Okay, well, what we don't know is where are these points in relation to each other? Numerically or mathematically, it's possible that when I design a beam, that the yield moment, you know, could be designed such that once I crack the beam, it instantly overloads the steel and it just cuts everything off, right? Then my, you know, that my, you know, and that will happen if I have a really big section with a really large cracking moment. I put an itty bitty piece of steel right there, right? That once this cracks, all of a sudden these strains jump from whatever the strain in the concrete was to some monster value that fails the bar instantly, okay? And so what they want to do is they want to make sure that you put enough reinforcement in such that this scenario cannot happen, okay? You know, even with the reinforcing, that the, when the beam cracks, it will fail suddenly. Okay, so what ACI has done is they have a minimum reinforcement ratio that they make you check. Okay, and it's a basically AS min is is the greater of the two of these particular equations, right? Okay, and so they're going to take three root F prime C BWD over FY. Again, we talked about this root F prime C. Make sure that F prime C is in PSI. That goes there. Okay, or we're at 200 BWD over FY. And so we want to kind of, kind of, it's one of those two is the AS minimum. And you take the larger of the two minimum values. And when I do that, that will almost always ensure that I can get, that once it cracks, I can still keep increasing the moment up to, to yield that I don't get that sudden failure once it cracks. So that's the minimum. Okay. And so in these formulas, just to kind of for clarification, our BW is basically the effective width of the compression block. Okay, for SRR beams, BW is almost always equal to B. For T beams, um, this value may be something different, and we'll talk about that when we get to those. But um, for what we're doing, since we're doing SRR, this will apply for all we can do, right? Another way to look at it is, is that I can rewrite all of this a little bit such that we calculate a row minimum, okay? Because again, look at the formula. I've got an A here and I've got a B and a D here. If I take those two guys over to this side, BD, BD is in both equations, I can rewrite this as a row min value, okay? And that's just three root F prime C over FY, okay? And then I can use that to check that against my row balance or I can check that against the row that I'm providing. And so as long as I'm over that limit, we're in, we're in good shape, okay? So that becomes one of the things that we can do, okay? So now, one of the problems that we have, though, is, is that for very large beams, beams with very large sections for whatever reason, okay, this can result in a very large quantity of steel, which may not actually be needed for strength. Right? So ACI in section 9.6.1.3 also has the provision that if I give a certain amount of steel that is 33% higher than what I actually need for strength, okay, then the AS min check is not required. I'm saying they're saying if you give yourself 33% extra steel in this, you know, so you know, say you just have a monster set of dimensions on this thing, okay, you no, know, and I only need it, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's a mass related issue and a dynamics problem, you know, that we want to be kind of that it's one of the scenarios that can happen. So, so they're saying that you know you wouldn't want to have to come up with this minimum amount of steel for a monster dimension because you just have massive amounts of extra steel that you had to kind of put down in your beam. All right. Okay. So if you're greater than 33% of what's required for strength, then the AS min check isn't required at all. So that's one of the one of the things that we have. Okay. So a couple of quick provisions. So it's not hard, and the methodology is pretty easy as you start to kind of work your way through that. Okay. Now, the textbook, the Nielsen textbook has some very cool design aids for this, okay? 
and it's one of the reasons that I select this book because I like these these aids is they kind of go through and if you look at table 8.5 of your textbook okay this will be back in the appendix of this okay they actually have what they call the, the flexural resistance factors these R tables if you will and what they're going to do is they're going to redefine that ultimate moment that this guy my phi mn on this as being phi times R times BD squared Okay, so basically they lump all of that AS stuff and all those other factors into this one little R guy. Okay, and so R is a resistance factor. Now again, it's not a resistance factor like phi, because that's the same label that we had. It's its own different resistance factor, but it's based on rho, it's based on Fy, and it's based on F prime C. Okay, and so what I can do is I can very quickly solve for my R value um, by simply rearranging this thing and say that R is going to be mu over phi times BD squared. So you can quickly choose your, your, your dimensions of your beam and with that I can figure out what my required R is and then I can come in and say alright well I've got 40 KSI steel, 60 KSI steel and I have F prime C that is 3, 4, 5 and 6,000 PSI. So if I know my FY and I know my F prime C and I know what R value I need based off of this equation I can just say you know so say we needed an R of you know 418 and that's going to be a, a PSI unit on R. Say, say that's what we had for, you know, for an example for us there. All I have to do, you know, and say just for good measure that, you know, F prime C is 3000, okay, and FY, that's 3000 uh, PSI and F, FY is 40 KSI. All I would do to find that, to, to find out what I need in terms of the area of steel, is I come to my 40,000 PSI steel table, I find my F prime C of 3,000, and I read down to the first value that's greater than 418. And if you look, I've got a value sitting here at 419. Oops, get a little bit higher so you guys can see it. And I, can, I just basically read down this column until I find 419. That's this value, and then all I have to do is read off that. Okay, and so that value, if I can see it, that uh, row that you would use to solve this beam problem is 0.0115 would be required for strength. Okay, and if I have that value, then all I do is I check row min. Are you greater than row min? Okay, where are you in this? And then I can even check row versus is row less than row balance? Okay. And then I can kind of start working myself off of this. And so that gets you a very quick first guess on the area of steel. Now you do still need to go back and check the strains once you've made your steel selection and go back and check your strain diagrams accordingly. But otherwise, these, these R tables are very, very simple to be able to pull off a row and then I can turn that into an AS and then I can go back and replay the game. It becomes an analysis problem that you just check and start checking all of your assumptions. Okay, so again, you've got to check, you know, must check. Your, your, your fee requirements, right, which means, you know, what is the value of epsilon t on this, okay, and again, what you're wanting is that greater than 0 0.005 is kind of the, the target, so this is the approach. It's very, very simple and very, very cool the way that it starts to work. All right, so again, for my classes, I have them work through some of these problems that kind of walk you through the methodology, and so you can see the type of problem that might be given. We know that we want an SRR section. We have a B of 14, a D of 21 and a half, concrete covers given, the layer spacing, which now the layer spacing for bars, if in this case I have this, that's this dimension. All right, that's the layer spacing. Okay, we say that we have four number 10 bars, so two in each row. Okay, we're gonna take an F prime C of 5,000, and we're gonna take an FY of 60 KSI. Okay, so what I have them do in this is the first thing is I have them figure out what is row B. Okay, so I gotta find out my area of steel. I've got that. I've gotta find my beta one. Epsilon CU, nothing to really look up. You know this value, it's gotta be 0 0.003. Okay, we wanna find our epsilon S equal to epsilon Y. What is that value? Okay, and so again, this is 60 KSI, so you know that number. This is just a check for them to make sure that they remember the values. Okay, and then once I have all of this, I can calculate row balance. All right, and then what I have, the question I ask is, is this section under reinforced, over reinforced, or balanced? And so all you do is calculate the row actual. And well, that's just AS over BD. Okay, and so if your actual is less than row balanced, you know you're under reinforced. If it's equal to row balanced, you know you're balanced. And if it's 
greater than or balance, you know, you're over reinforced. Okay, and then so you have that. And then I also go through and I have them use those, those flexural resistance factors, those R tables, to kind of work through that as well. So we've got our strain actual, okay, that comes out of this. We get our phi and we get our R and we can kind of start to work our way through the problem and so forth. And then I ask the question, is this section sufficient for this moment? So that's the kind of question that we'll start to kind of look at on this, all right? Okay. Now, another question that I'll have them do sometimes is a little bit, is kind of a little bit different. And this is kind of getting them to perceive more than just what the, the lesson is looking, seeing if they can start to apply stuff. So I've got a rectangular section, a height of H, a width of B. I call out, you know, that I have a stirrup and a rebar uh, spacing, concrete cover, FRMC, FY. Everything else is kind of the same, all right? So what I have them do, and again, on these packets, you know, this might be like a take-home problem or something. I don't have them, I don't give them the procedure to walk through. They've done it once. Now that I want them to go through and start to figure out if they can calculate these things on their own. All right, and so the first one we do is row of 0 .005. You've done that. Row min, you've got that. Okay, and then based off of that, can we figure out what the dimensions of B and H need to be, and what would you do? Okay, well, clearly we would, you know, if we know our cover, you know, we would go through and we would play with the R tables. And so that's just kind of working this thing backwards. Okay, and then once I figure out the row from the R tables, then I can go in and figure out, um, or in this case, come up with H and, H and B um, dimensions. Um, I did fail to point out that I wanted the depth to be twice the width. So that gives you the approach to be able to unravel that R equation. Okay, and then we can determine the required area of steel, you know, including the, the ACI checks for the minimums. Okay, and then basically figuring out, well, how do I arrange that seal if I need to provide a number three stirrup and figuring out how many bars can I get in, you know, based off of this, this spacing requirement that's been given as two inches. So that's a slightly different version of this problem that my classes will, will start to kind of work. So anyway, I hope that's been fairly clear. Okay, again, what we've done is we've kind of looked at kind of procedure for doing design. Okay, a case where I know the load and now I want to know either what do my dimensions need to be or what does my area of steel for a given set of dimensions need to be to be able to work it and then go through and do all of the checks in this, in this packet and in this procedure accordingly. So anyway, as always, if you'll you know, toss us a comment if you've got any questions or a suggestion for the way that we can make things better, I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, please be sure to like the video if you liked it and please subscribe to our channel and we'll keep more coming at you. So anyway, have a wonderful evening and happy engineering. Thank you.